I'd like to get started by asking about the the upcoming event. First of all, to set the stage for why we're we're all here, it takes place on, on Thursday, April twenty fifth, Bobby. Right. It's part of your Inside the Cutting Room series, for which you've come on uh, many times. It's such a great series. Tell me about some of uh, Stephen's work that we're going to be focusing most on during this event. We're going to be um, primarily focusing on um, the the films that we are also showing clips from, um, which will, will be The World According to Garp, The Right Stuff, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, The Parent Trap, Enchanted, and if we have time, Little Big Man, because that was a film that inspired Stephen, and uh, we do want to leave enough time for Q&A, so we just have to see how it goes. Yeah, well, there, well, there's so many movies that, <laughs> that you guys could delve into forever on his resume. I mean, it's a, it's incredible reviewing your it roster was difficult. of difficult. It's 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 difficult to do to find. There's so much, as you said, um, but there's. It's always interesting to not only offer a range of genre, but different directors and different challenges to, to compare and contrast. And I think this is a good sampling of that. Yeah. So, Stephen, t- tell me how uh, how you found yourself in the world of editing. How, how did what was that trajectory like? Well, actually, the trajectory really happened because I met my now wife, who was working in NBC, and uh, happened to take a tour in NBC and thought that uh, the world of television ha- held some interest for me. And in trying to squeeze into the world of television, I ended up in a a news film department at NBC, and uh, you know that included editing for Huntley Brinkley and documentaries uh, and projects of that ilk. And then, uh, having discovered that I liked it, I uh, thought, well, as long as I enjoy editing, why shouldn't I try and edit on a much uh, larger scale? So I left NBC to freelance and. Uh, Luckily, made some you know amazing connections, and uh, it just seemed to uh, fall into place with with uh, out much effort on my part, just you know cruising from project to project, uh, inspired by a mentor and pushed by a mentor. So um, that's how it happened, more or less. And I mean, it's a good many years that seems like uh, an instant. <laughs> yeah. Well, you must have felt that you had uh, a strong sense of of storytelling, I I mean, to embark on this career. Well, you know, I think that when you embark on this career, you're you're focused mainly on on trying to be good at what you do, and um, you can be... uh, I I don't think you're conscious of your own talents until you become somewhat successful, and then in retrospect you think to yourself, Gee, I must, you know, I guess I do have a good sense of story. I guess I can evaluate performance. But I think on the way, you're not conscious of whatever gifts you have because they can be learned. They can be inspired by others. And um, uh, a lot of luck uh, is involved by working on, you know, relatively decent material. There are many people that probably have uh, an equal amount of talent that just, for whatever reason, have not been able to make the right connections or been in, not been in the right place. Mm-hmm. So in that way, I was lucky. And I suppose in retrospect, yeah, I do have all those attributes that probably made for, uh, you know, um, a successful career. I mean, I do, you know, story senses where most films can live or die by. I mean, I think that's the most important element of a film. And so... Uh, you know, I think that you just discover that you have those talents as you're moving through uh, various uh, stages of your career. Mm-hmm. And so who was your, your mentor throughout well, this? Well, my mentor was a woman who died a couple of years ago named Dee Dee Allen, who at that yeah. time, uh, yeah. when I was training, was some was pretty universally known as, uh, if not the best, one of the very best editors in the country. And so, you know, for what seemed like a lot of years, I was working as her uh, assistant and then up to her main assistant. But in all actuality, it was only maybe three or four years. Mm. So that was, uh, I mean, Dee Dee was 
legendary in, in the film editing world, um, uh, particularly because her breakthrough was was it Bonnie and Clyde? That yes, was her big that break. Was- that yeah. was her. That was what brought her. Her, you know, uh, the initial um, uh, uh, shot of, of uh, notoriety that sort of propelled her to become, you know, what was uh, pretty universally known as as one of the best in the world. And of course, Bonnie and Clyde was, you know, just the seminal film of, in terms of filmmaking in this country. So yeah, and and from then on, you know, from there on, she really uh, went on to do, um, you know, many many great great films. Well, she also have... called it the Arthur Penn School because uh-huh. um, that was where um, he he um, there were a lot of wonderful editors, including Stephen, who trained under Dee Dee when she was editing for him. One of the reasons being that. He shot a tremendous amount of film and coverage and needed a lot of editors and um, a source of inspiration for both. I think I can. it's fair to say not only D.D. Allen, but Stephen. So. Mm. Yeah, and, and the other thing you have to realize is that, you know, through her, I worked with some of the best directors ever, and um, the exposure was was fantastic and in those days without digital editing you know she used people right at her elbow handing her clips and she would talk like a stream of consciousness of why she was doing something and so even though you only learn by actually doing you absorbed a lot that came into play later on in your career i mean you know i always say that that not only did she teach me what to do but in some instances what not to do Mm. So, well, I would imagine that from reviewing her work and yours and and the work of all great directors really there's there's obviously the sensitivity to to reading what's on the screen and knowing what beats you have to you have to make but uh there's also uh, there's no fear of being bold of making bold choices uh that, did, did that's that absolutely of, right. So you felt like that categorized her her contribution in the editing room? Well, absolutely. First of all, there was no fear of making bold choices. Number two, there was no stone left unturned. Her dedication and her uh, uh, stick-to-itiveness was legendary. So uh, it did give you a sense of values about why and where and and how to do things. Um, And, of course, her, her eye was always on the story and the performance. Mm. Uh, and, and you know, of course, with Arthur, uh, he loved uh, you know bold. He loved to do bold things, both in directing and in editing. So um, it was it was just uh, probably a match made in heaven, the two of them. And, and uh, of course, later on, films with George Roy Hill it was the same uh, same kind of combination. That, yes, I mean that's uh, when I look at your resume. I mean, there's speaking of bold. Uh, I mean, Garp is definitely <laughs> bold, uh, as is little little big man, and the right stuff is about as as uh, epic and bold as it gets. Um, but I I would imagine you you must have developed a great rapport with with Arthur Penn. Was he? The, a, a constant presence in the editing room was there. Was there very close work that you did that you do well, with him? Uh, no, actually, it's funny because Arthur worked unlike most directors. He he would um, screen a film, give notes, go away, come back, screen it again, uh, maybe have friends come in and screen it. But it was mostly through note taking and discussions. He, you know, in those days, uh, working on moviolas or cams or steambecks as opposed to digital editing, directors didn't have the same kind of patience to sit while the while the film was being edited because it was awkward to look at a movie on the screen and sometimes it was awkward to look at a steam bag. So Arthur preferred to go away, stay as fresh as possible, come back, look and give an, another set of notes. And, you know, we used to joke because his favorite expression was... Um, uh, we're getting there, and we always used to say among ourselves after about six months, "When are we going to be there?" And so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we 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 would. Uh, it was a standing joke. And the other thing was, um, as I, <clears throat> as I was saying to Bobby, when I first 
started my first very first film working with Dee Dee and as like a second assistant, not even the first assistant, uh she had finished a rough cut of Alice's restaurant and we screened it for ourselves before showing it to Arthur. And then a few days later Arthur came in and looked at it and he started to make wholesale changes. And I was thinking to myself, How can he make changes? The film is unbelievable. How can he do that? <laughs> <laughs> and so, of course, I quickly learned after that that, that the process was was a lot more complicated than I thought it was. Is the director generally, though, uh, I mean, because they labor over every every frame in the production phase of, of the project, do you find that they are precious about the footage that they've shot, or are the best directors do the best directors recognize when, no, this movie works better as a whole if we just get rid of that? Altogether. Well, yeah, the best directors are able to. Uh, um, well, <laughs> they they all hang on to things for different reasons for different lengths of time, but of course the best ones come up with what you and yourself as uh, an editor working on it can think of as the best movie possible out of what they shot. Mm. And so I think it, I think that the answer to that would be anyone who can bring themselves to the full potential of that movie without um you know without uh any self indulgence and of course yeah. you you know you look at movies and of course there are things that are self indulgent in every movie and there are many successful movies that I worked on that I still think you know if the director had let me I would have done x y or z but it you know uh you're there mainly to facilitate their vision and perhaps enhance it or add to it. So, uh, you know, there are other things besides talent that come into play, like personality, um, you know, the ability to uh, impart ideas without being overbearing. Uh, it's it's like you're a junior partner in the making of the film. Mm. Well, when you're trying to reach the full potential of what the film can be, um, how does that start for you? Do you do you prefer to have to, to to study the script prior to production and have conversations with the director prior to cutting, or do you prefer to just go in with the first frame and 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 realize it from that stage? Well, I think the more communication between the director and the editor, the better off the editor is. Uh, so it, it's great to have conversations before. It's also great to have conversations. As each scene is shot, when you screen dailies together, uh, it never hurts to have hints of you know what the director really likes. Uh, and of course, you can always depart from that, and you can say to them, "Listen, I just did this um, because uh, I had this idea, and it may not work." But of course, with digital editing, you're able to do all those things and put them aside, and later bring them up. Mm. You know, so there's been a big change. Digital editing allows you to both do what you think the director wants and do what you, I mean, you know, there's a whole, uh, it opened up a whole um, set of possibilities that's time consuming, but, uh, you know, interesting to uh, to perceive. I, I was telling Bobby that, you know, as you're doing the, as your career progresses, I think the most important thing that you learn is that when you do something yourself, you're able to judge it and say, oh, that's the worst thing I've ever seen. I better... I better start again, or I better try something else, as opposed to, I did it. You know, looks pretty good. So the self, your self evaluation of what you've done is really important. Hmm. I want to talk a little bit about tone and 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 Bobby to get to get you involved in this, too. But I, I'm thinking of the world according to Garp, which is this beautifully odd uh, uh, book. Um, and, and to, to to try to translate the tone of that into film, was that a, was that a tricky balance to achieve in the editing? Well, I think that um, it pretty much the film pretty much laid out as shot. In other words, the director the director really in in that case had a fairly clear idea of where he wanted to go. The tricky part um, was to try and bring it to life and make it feel real. And mm. so, um, you know, I think that choice of performance there, I mean, don't forget it was Robin's first movie, and I think it was Glenn's first movie. So um, 
you know, you were dealing, you know, George was dealing with uh, sort of uh, fresh lumps of clay that he could mold. I mean, he was he was wonderful with actors, and so um, you know, I think that uh, that that really shone through in the movie. And so the movie was this collection of odd things that happened. And uh, I, I remember that a lot of these movies, you know, were not were that well received when they came out. Uh, certainly, Garp was not that well received. And uh, I remember George being, I mean, George was sort of like, um, he always expected the worst. So when he read a, the, a, bad te- uh, a bad review in Time magazine, he sort of had this bitter laugh about him. But, uh, it, you know, the Garp's, um, Garp's sort of uh, uh, record led him back to making more conventional movies. Mm. Mm. I, I I always loved Garp. I, it, oh, it, I thought, it, it, I, you know, first of all, it was my first movie that I actually edited. And I had a I had a friend come in and help me out named Ron Roos, and uh, for me, it was like a gift from heaven to be able to sort of. Didi was busy. He knew me from you know when it's being an assistant on Slaughterhouse Five. Uh, I was friendly with his producer, so he said to himself, I suppose, why not? And uh, so, you know, for me it was unbelievable. Although, you know, no one ever talks about sort of the other's emotional state as they go through these movies. Mm. But, Steve, you told a, a funny story about your self-doubt on that and the sounds of the cuts. I, I right, thought that was right. You know, in in uh, in, in early in editing before digital, of course, you spliced everything together with tape, and so when you would run it in the projector. Even when you were behind the project, you know you were in a regular screening room. You could still hear the splices hit the projector, so we go. Tick, 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 tick. Mm. So in some cases, early on before I got to Garp, when I would, you know, screen a uh, scene that I'd cut, it sounded like a machine gun because I'd made so many splices in the, you know, trying to find the right spot. So when uh, just we when we cut negative on Garp. Uh, and we were supposed to look at the print and the next day. I suddenly I couldn't sleep that night. I was in a, a cold sweat because I thought that the only reason the cuts of this movie was because every time we hit a splice and it went dit, 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 and it jumped a little bit, that's what gave, that's what made the cuts work because otherwise, if they were smooth, I thought they were a disaster. So all night I was in a cold sweat. I went to... Uh, I went to the uh, first screening, the first print, like I was going to the death chamber. And, of course, everything was fine. It looked great, you know. And I, I, I look at it today, and I'm just amazed uh, at not only how good it looks, but also uh, remembering the anxiety went through, uh, I went through on that movie because it was my first. And, of course, the anxiety doesn't get that much better as you go along. Well, I think that's interesting. You know, I all the editors I talk to, no matter how great an experience they are, always say there is that element. And I think that's, you know, the creative process, and it also creates adrenaline, you know. It does. But it, it, it's, it it's does. very interesting that all editors have moments during, especially when you first start a film. And I think Garp was also, um, you know, the it's always problematic when you're translating a beloved book because people hold it precious and they may have had preconceived notions and it was a, a, a challenging challenging material that could go different ways. Um, and, and I think the politics, too, perhaps. The feminist politics, I'm not, I'm not sure. Right. But, it, yeah. it was early on, you know, it, it's funny because when we went to preview, we went to like five or six cities. Uh, it was the first time I had ever previewed a work print, which to me was like unbelievably harsh. But uh, they would take a survey how many people had read the book, and I think that not more than 2% of any audience had read the book, if that. Mm. So for the most part, you're dealing with the movie. Gro- with that movie, you were dealing with a movie-going audience that really no one had read the book. I mean, how many people... Read John Irving in terms of the general population. I mean, he has a, a huge following, but if you look at how, you know the millions of people that that read, uh, you know, you'd be surprised how few have read any of his books. Yeah, 
Well, I'm sure a lot more read uh, the world according to Garp after the film. <laughs> uh, well, one would hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm curious to know because I mean, Garp was like you said your 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 first uh, movie on on your own as an editor. Um, so when you look at that now, or the last time you looked at that, I know that I hear actors a lot when when they say that they look at their early work, they think, "Oh my gosh, what was I doing? I was so naive then." And do do you do you feel that way as an editor when you look at older work? I mean, actually, assess- I don't. Actually, I've been surprised. I, I always thought that I would think that, but I've been really almost shocked that. Uh, it seems to hold up, and the movies may not hold up, you know, because of the times. But, but um, the things that I worried about in terms of uh, editing seem fine to me. Bobby, I want to ask you about uh, your your take on on the the behemoth here in this in this resume, which is the the right stuff, which you guys are going to be tackling during this. Oh, during I this was. Event. Yeah, I mean, Jamie, I was so excited when um, we started talking about um, particularly the sequence, which actually was the first thing that Steve cut, um, because it's, you know, it's a huge special effects movie with no special effects. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's it's model airplanes, it's um, some very experimental filmmaking, you know, for the, the sound barrier, um, the sort of li- liquid crystal things, but... but the sequence that the breaking the sound barrier sequence that we're going to show, it's um, you know it was a problematic scene. It had already been edited, and what what Steve did to create, he just took these little you know these COT cartridge model airplanes with wires, and you know they were just kind of goofy looking really, and just purely by editing skill, in my opinion, you know it was. The, the dramatic sort of build up and momentum and energy that he created through sound and image because he did use sound to 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 um to to create a sort of um um co- continuity but these these airplane shots you know there were there were basically a lot of interior shots of the plane and virtually proportional out of proportion to the exterior shots and so Steve just went through all this tons of footage and and created, you know, um, a series of sometimes several airplane shots that were slightly different in angle to create this energy and mm. and and pace and rhythm, and it's it's a great cutting room scene. And once he did that, of course, the director was thrilled, and then do do all the do all these other action scenes. But I I just love he didn't have CGI. He couldn't you know create this perfect world. He had to go by the seat of his pants, and I got very excited about that. And the movie has such a great quality of. Um, I mean, I can't quite find the word, but it, I mean, it, it, innocence. Uh, there's no narcissism. It's not cynical. Uh, right. About- Right. Yeah, I, I actually just feel like I have to point out that it, you know, there were five editors on that movie, so my part of it was simply one part, and and of course everyone made contributions. But the great thing uh, I think about that movie was that, in terms of uh, editorial, was he dealt with performance, texture, colors. I mean, if you look at it, there are things there that I've never even seen in movies since then that I've, you know, to work with. I mean, there are actually color tones that you worked with, and uh, you could change the color of the background. It was like, you know, totally, uh, you know, really exciting to to do, and um, it was like, in in some ways, it was like working in a Japanese factory. You know, we had aerobics together. We, um, uh, you know, people would go running at, at lunchtime. Uh, there was a shower there. <laughs> but what was like, also really interesting that you said, Steve, is that um, there was a point where there was sort of a burnout with Philip Kaufman. He didn't want to look at the film anymore as a whole. There was so much film. And and so so Steve said that there was a point where they weren't running the whole film for, I think you said, six months. And then you, you, there was some concern. There's so many editors involved, and will it will it be a cohesive whole? And then... 
you were so surprised to find that all the parts sort of did work together. And I thought right. that was really interesting. Who and, knew, and, you know? And to me, uh, well, the interesting thing is that apparently Phil knew more than than uh, he was letting on because there was he he did have a certain confidence in that project that I guess we never really recognized. You know, he um, his his uh, and uh, the other films that I've done with him, he tries to maintain as fresh an eye as possible. And of course, if you screen the film weekly, uh, that freshness sort of disappears. So his theory is that you ha- you have to maintain a certain freshness to the material as long as you can. Well, it, it reminds me of it must be. The, the ultimate challenge to keep fresh eyes during the process because you know the the way you're describing the right stuff and you're bombarded with all of this material and such kind of meticulous work that a lot of people are working on in a kind of a factory like setting and then i think of what didi went through with reds um uh, around the same time or a little earlier and that was such a mammoth project how do you maintain that that perspective well, I, I think that um, <clears throat> the biggest challenge is, is to maintain that perspective, and I guess that uh, the only way that I can explain it is that you, when you work on a project, you have such devotion to it and love for it, uh, whether it be good, bad, or indifferent, you all, you're always think that it's great. And so it's that sort of uh, belief that pushes you to try and make it better and better. So I'm not sure that you have the proper perspective, but you're always trying to uh, raise the film uh, to a different level. So, you know, there are a lot of times when you even a 5% improvement is enormous or a 2% improvement when you get to that stage or, you know, suddenly you lift a scene or you cut a scene in half and lo and behold. So a lot of that perspective sort of uh, view is also spurred by a collaboration of the director feeling something, you're feeling something, a screening with an audience. You know, one of the big reasons for previews is that at a certain point, seeing the film through an audience's eyes is a lot different than seeing it through your own eyes. So you go to a preview, and immediately you can sense where there are lags, where, particularly in comedies, where something isn't working. Uh, so for the filmmakers, a preview is great, except for the fact that there's um, the danger of the studio trying to push, you know, trying to... to uh, um, force things as a result right. of either you know either a preview or a Q&A session so it's a double edged sword but definitely seeing the audience, seeing it through a large audience is a big uh, uh is one way to keep a, a correct perspective on the thing uh, you know well, on well, the movie with, itself especially with all of these terrific comedies you've You've worked on because uh, speaking of keeping perspective, I mean, if you hear any joke a hundred times, uh, as I'm sure you do in the editing room when you're editing some of these great comedies, at, at some point it's no longer funny. So that's uh, you're absolutely right. Except that when you go to a preview, if the audience is laughing hysterically, you are too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, it's infectious, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and you're, you're you're really not laughing. Because it's funny to you, you're laughing because you're swept along by the audience and also the relief at at finding that a joke really is working great. Mm, mm. And, you know, there are many films that I would say that I've done that over 90% of the jokes just work. Yeah. You know, you didn't really, or I felt like you weren't really, like, pulling teeth to make them work, that they just... You know, they just sort of happened. So, Bobby, tell me about the um, uh, the event takes place in, isn't it your new home? Is it take, yes. takes place? Yes. Okay. In the New French York. Institute. And I just did a, an event there. This is our second event. And what was, what was very encouraging and satisfying was the audience is a lovely mix of film buffs and editors and filmmakers and students. You really get a, a good balance and I think that's really what I'm trying to reach. I I I'm very much um as you know so well 
um, driven to um, pull back the curtain and really show show not only the public but but uh, aspiring and young editors who want to learn from the masters and to to really to really let people see what the editor really did accomplish in the cutting room and the only way you can really you'll never get the whole story of course but you you the only way to really find out is to talk to the editor and have the editor show and tell and and describe the challenges and the you know what what the nature of the footage was what the relationship with the director was what what the nature of the screenplay is you know all of those things are are very revealing and seem to be fascinating to to all audiences i'm always kind of amazed that the public is really knowledgeable and and very curious about yeah. the behind the scenes of editing you know is is it going to be uh, for for our listeners out there that aren't in the new york area is it you guys live streamed the last event. Didn't you? We we tried, but it didn't quite work. <laughs> but <laughs> it was a learning curve. It, it had to do with people not turning off their phones, believe it or not. Oh. Wow. Um, yeah. So we're we're going to get around that problem, and we will live stream this time. Oh, um, I'm so look forward to it. We, yeah, I'm excited about that as well to re- to reach a, a larger audience. Yeah, well, I'm I'm very excited for the event, um, Stephen. Your your body of work is incredible, and I, I so appreciate your contribution to movies. I mean, a lot of these have meant a, a lot of these titles have meant a lot to me. So thank you. Well, thank you. And it's you know it's always surprising to hear that. <laughs> well, your your movies uh, are so beloved. It shouldn't be a surprise at all. Your your work is just tremendous. Thank you so much. Thank you, and Bobby. Thank you too. Thank you, Jamie.